Hi, my name is Addie Morfoot. I'm a reporter with Variety. Um, I have blonde hair, brown eyes. I'm wearing a, a denim shirt. And I'm going to, our public, uh, publicists, our uh, panelists are going to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Ramin Barani. Um, I have blackish hair and, and a t shirt in Brooklyn, New York. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Uh, I'm my name is Daniel Turkan. Uh I'm uh, one of the producers. I have a greenish shirt, uh, polo gray polo shirt, and a couch behind me. Um, I'm John Galvin, one of the other producers. Um, Daniel also has a little bit of gray hair as well. He hid that in his description, but I just want to highlight that for everyone. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wearing a. Uh, a green shirt and I'm sitting in front of an equally green wall. So everything is green where I am, but pleasure. Well, we can replace you in the post, which is good. Uh, I'm Jacob Grodnick. I am one of the other producers on the project. Uh, I'm wearing a blue um, golf shirt actually, but I just, it, it's come to be my like Zoom shirt because it's comfy and looks nice. Um, and I am, I have freckles and I'm sitting in a room in Los Angeles. Okay, well, I just want to say that um, congratulations on the film. I mean, everyone in the audience just watched it. What a watch it is. Um, I, I wanted to start off, since I have the producers um, on the panel today, you know, Ramin, I heard you at the Woodstock Film Festival say that producers brought this project to you in hopes that you would make it into a fictional film. So I'm wondering, Jacob, Johnny, and Daniel, were you those producers that brought it? The, okay, Johnny, you were. Well, yeah, actually, so Jacob originated the idea and brought it to us, um, and, uh, and, and, and then we'd met Ramin, yeah. And you three were going to make the documentary. Was that the plan? Jacob, please begin. It begins with you. I mean, yeah, how it, how it started was with uh, kind of coming across this amazing idea, meeting Richard Davis and um, uh, some initial interviews with him. And the initial idea was, let's make it, you know, it's a screenplay, it's a, it's a fiction film. And then I got introduced to Johnny and Daniel, who their whole platform was, we're going to do both. Let's, why don't we, um, you know, create a documentary and develop a feature film at the same time. Um, and then, so we were working on kind of both leaning towards getting the documentary off first. Um, and then once Ramin came on board, it like happened in two days, it felt like. Definitely. Um, well, Ramin, what was it about the story? I mean, it, it's it's so compelling, but I'm wondering what struck you and what made you want to do it as a documentary? Uh, well, first, thanks for watching the film and speaking with us. You know, I, I was fortunate that the producers contacted me. I remember um, I was editing The White Tiger. I, I mainly make fiction films. I've made seven or eight fiction feature films and a couple of short docs. And um, when Johnny and Daniel zoomed with me with, and with Jacob, um, I was initially just amazed by the footage um, that Richard had shot of himself shooting himself. Yeah. Um, it, it was so kind of breathtaking and, and awesome and frightening. And the more I saw the archival footage, because he, he made, other, other than a lot of archives, it was like an eight hour movie he had made, which was part marketing, part propaganda, part comedy, dark comedy, or absurdist comedy. So all that archival got me interested in the thinking about the doc um, instead of the fiction. And thematically, it just seemed very rich with possibilities. It was very character driven, which I like in my own work. And there seemed to be larger themes at play. Um, I mean, there's obviously a lot of gun and gun violence in the film, but it seemed to be about much more than that, about um, cognitive dissonance, a man myth, myth making, you know, legend and let's say in a larger scope, country building, but through, through violence and through mythology and um, just kind of a, a absence of moral thought also seemed very, 
it just seemed rich, rich with possibilities. Well, what I read was that you expected him to feel some sort of, when you were interviewing, some sort of shame or regret, or at least admit that he was wrong. So I'm wondering when you got the unexpected answers, how did that shift your vision of the film from when, you know, from when your concept to when you got there to do the interview? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I um, it's complicated. I, I kind of liked Richard. I enjoyed him. Um, I don't agree with him. I don't agree with probably most of his philosophies about life, but I, I did like him and, and he did do something very brave and very courageous. I mean, shooting yourself to prove your own invention works takes a lot of guts and it, and it saved lives. It saved thousands of lives. So I respect him for that. Um, at the same time, I was thinking about from the very beginning, I was thinking about Arthur Miller and his play, All My Sons, and um, which has a similar story in a way. And so I thought when I met Richard, yes, I thought he was going to be self-reflexive. He was going to tell me about the facts of what happened, which I have documents kind of backing it, and he knows that. Um, but he didn't. He, he seemed incapable of recognizing his own role um his own volition and what what took place and um I, I do remember driving home after a couple of two days of interviewing with Richard and talking to Johnny and Daniel we, we would drive back and forth from the hotel to the to Richard's cabin together and I remember telling them gosh I, I don't even know what the film is now I, I thought it was going to be this man coming kind of reckoning with the good and the bad of of what he had done and and what he where he felt his life was but he did not I'm not even sure if he wasn't capable of doing it. I'm not sure it's actually the way he functions as a person. Um, and I would say initially I was scared. I was like, I don't know what the movie's about. And I'm, I make fiction films. So I was like, wait a second. I, I tried not to go there with expectations, but suddenly I was like, I wonder where the movie's going to find itself. Well, so, so I also read that you asked producers, and I'm assuming Jacob, Johnny, and Daniel, that you were the producers to find, you know, the ex-wife, um, uh, other characters, the woman who had MS to kind of fill in. I, I, I don't know. You tell me. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I, as we were driving together, you know, I mentioned to Johnny and Daniel, Citizen Kane, and um, we come to learn about Kane through other people. You know, um, it's through investigating Kane through other people's perspectives that we come to understand who he is and also kind of the larger themes at play. And some of the people we were speaking with were not very talkative. Um, I had made a short film in Texas, and when you asked anyone anything, they talked a lot, and it was very interesting and often very funny. Yeah. And here you would ask people in northern Michigan, tell me about your regrets in life, and they would look at you and be like, None. <laughs> uh, tell me about the most amazing thing that happened with you and Richard. Nice guy. <laughs> and it was like, oh, I was like, oh my God, this is um, this is not very uh, uh, engaging. So um, we had some good people in the first round of shooting, but really not enough. And that's yeah, that's when I turned Johnny and Daniel in the car and I said, um, based on the um, things I've read, that his ex ex had written she sounds amazing can we please convince her to be in this movie can we find her we had spoken to some of of um Richard's employees but they were employees that he put in front of us and I was like can we just find other people who worked in that factory sewing the vests I don't need the top engineer from the co company I just want someone that worked there that can provide some color and insight into who he was and hopefully about this kind of um tragic turn of events that happened with the Xylon vests, which is a turning point in the company and film. And um, there were other people like, please hire a, a, a detective and see if you can track down the man who shot Aaron Westrick. We also tried to track down people that were involved in Richard's origin story. His origin story, which is a mythology really, involves violence. It involves in a, a shootout with several people and Unfortunately, the detective came to find that those people were unfortunately had passed away. So we didn't get their perspective on that kind of fateful, potentially fictitious night or exaggerated night. And um, also Tim Pazensky showed up in the, in the second round of shooting. The, the, 
man that that Richard had haunted when he was a when the young man was a teenager, and now, you know, twenty five years later, you're you're seeing that man still kind of trembling as he recalls what happened in his kind of brutal encounter with Richard. Mm. Well, let me ask Daniel and Johnny and Jacob. Um, I, I'm always interested in how filmmakers or producers um, convince, I guess is the only word I can think of, subjects to reveal themselves on camera, you know, to go and talk about some of their darkest times or worst parts of their lives. Um, how do you convince someone like Richard to 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 share his story and then also all the characters you know this isn't something that <clears throat> like people wanted to talk about especially his son you know what what is the how do you make them feel comfortable and, and how do they trust you um it's uh it's obviously the the greatest challenge uh that and finding a bunch of money uh mm -hmm. but it's it's one of the greatest challenges for for a producer and for a doc producer um each case, each person, each story is different. Um, I think there's multiple factors, obviously, here. One is uh, is Ramin, is the director, is being in the room with them, is uh, them feeling comfortable with them, uh, probably knowing that 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 the the politics or the ideas are very different that they share, that they don't share, but it's someone that will listen to them and respect them. And I think for us, when we're choosing the director we want to work with on a documentary, it's important to find someone that not only has those 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 chops, but also can provide that level of of uh, reassurance in the room without necessarily being um, uh, being manipulative. Um, and I think that Ramin did an incredible job at that. Um, Jacob was the first person who had uh, interactions with uh, with Richard, and I think they. They, and Jacob, you can speak to that, but they they got along very well. So that was a sort of a, a an easy introduction for us to then come in. Um, Richard is of a certain age. Uh, he's done some some bad things in his life. He's also done some incredible things in his life. So he felt this was an opportunity to to share his side of the story. Uh, maybe one of his last opportunities to do so. Um, there was an interesting uh, conversation that we had with his son, uh, Matt, who's in the film. Who's very much who's a controlling part of the family, if you will, today, uh, and he he had said that at first he thought that the film was going to be uh, fifty percent good and fifty percent bad, and towards the end of the shooting he felt like those percentages might be a little different and it might be more on the bad side. So I think uh, I think anyone who goes in to documentary as a subject probably believes to an extent that they can control their the narrative. Uh, and little by little, not on all documentaries, but probably on on good ones, the the subject loses that control. Um, so at first, I think there was a sense that they could control their their narrative. And Jacob, maybe you can speak a little bit about how you your first interactions with with Richard and how you made him feel comfortable as well. Yeah, I think the the initial interactions were, you know, just amazed at his story. So it was really coming from a sense of um, awe and amazement to what he accomplished. Um, and kind of building, you know, like any human to human relationship is building a sense of trust that that's what I'm interested in. Um, and then through the process of uh, working with Giant Daniel and then, you know, with Ramin, there were other parts of the story that were discovered um, and being a, you know, a documentary, it's a piece of journalism in a way, you can't ignore these other elements and, you know, we're not being paid by Richard to make the film, right? So you have to, address everything that relates to the story. Um, so I think it is just a slow kind of um, shift to, you know, telling the truth, um, but maintaining the, you know, sense of trust that we're not here to make a hit piece in a way. Yeah, there's, there's two very, very quick answers, which, which I hope our audience will, will appreciate. The, the first is Matt, who Daniel mentioned, the son is, is, is quite, so controlling, and he prepped very hard for his interview, sat down, and the first question Ramin says is, what do you dream of at night? And he's like, <laughs> you know, completely thrown off. He's like, wait, he's like, I am not prepared for this. And you could see him visibly like, and, and, and that kind of set the tone for the whole thing. It's like, we're not here to hear your kind of PR talk of everything you've rehearsed. We just, we want to cut way beneath that. So that was a really fun 
And, 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 and a lesson for us actually as, as producers to say, okay, like that's how you take it, someone out of their element. But then um, Kathleen, who is, is one of Richard's ex-wives who gives this incredibly poetic interview, she was very nervous to come on camera. And we learned a, a very interesting sort of trick here. And, and actually we have to shout out our, our executive producers as well. One of our executive and co-producers who, who helped us do this, which was um, at, the, at the last minute, we altered the waiver so that we only had permission to uh, to use footage of her hands and her voice because she wanted to protect her identity. But during the filming, it was such a good uh, you know interview. I remember Ramin went to Adam Stone, the DP, like film up, and we could still film her. We just didn't have permission to use the her face. But so we we filmed the whole interview. And then after the fact, Ramin wrote her a letter during post and said, listen, this is how integral your, your part of the story is. And then she retroactively said, all right, fine. And then we sent her a new waiver and she gave the full release. So we, so we were able to get a partial release and, and that for us was one of the most important. Um, you know, she was very moved by the film when she saw it, Kathleen, and um, asked to be put into touch with um, Brenda, the woman who had MS. She didn't know that story and her relationship to the events. Um, and she she knew we were filming her. We ended up changing the tape and doing two or three more roles and she mm -hmm. saw what we were doing. But yes, she didn't sign the, the waiver until later. We could not use the footage until she did. But, you know, I, I, I just wanted to say that I legitimately wanted to know what Matt or anyone else was dreaming about at night. My, my questions were not necessarily just to disarm them, although yes, in some way, Johnny, they were, but I actually was really interested in that. I, I um, I, I told Matt, the son from the beginning, I'm not coming here to take your father down, but I am going to ask questions about the Zylon case and about other things in his life. I'm going to ask those hard questions. So you should know that, but I'm not here to take him down. I, I, and I really wasn't. I was surprised how many things Richard just kept saying to me on his own accord without me even asking. Um, and I think you get a sense, I hope at least from the other characters who are more willing to or able to go to the goals that I was more interested in what's going on in there. And, and uh, even I'm hesitant to say things like good or bad. I, 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 I don't want to. Um, Richard was in a very difficult position. You know, he had employees. There was a lot, a lot at stake. And, and he didn't make, I don't feel he made the, the right choice, but I, I do recognize it was a very difficult, a difficult one. You know, we've all been in that situation. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you about, you know, the lying that I can't imagine like interviewing someone and you have the documents right in front of you that, and he's denying them. Um, right. It's a very poetic film, but I'm, I'm wondering why you were doing these interviews where you're like, thinking to yourself, oh no, I'm making a hit piece because he's literally confessing, I mean, yeah. not confessing, lying to you. Yes, it was on my mind while shooting and even more in the editing. I would say there's certain things that Richard said that I started to feel like I didn't want to put it on, on camera because he's just digging himself into such a hole. Um, and I really wanted to try it also to highlight some of the, as I said, more courageous things he did. I, I really appreciated Tim, the, the young man that Richard tormented as a teenager. I mean, that guy went through something very difficult with Richard that, as I said, haunted him 20 years later. He was on camera tearing up and shaking, visibly shaking. But still, even he said, you know, the yin and the yang. He said Richard did good and he didn't do good, but I have to acknowledge he's done both. And I, I was really moved by him and also by Aaron, who, despite what happened between him and Richard, Aaron still is like, you know, I still care about, him. you know. I was also found it uh, pretty illuminating that, that Aaron said, I prefer to believe in Richard's, mythological origin story than to believe in what really happened. And that to me was very telling about people and, um, you know, about constructs of power that we live in right now, where we prefer to believe in mythologies and we don't want to accept when people tell us it's a lie. We're like, ah, 
Maybe I'll still vote that way anyhow. Or maybe I'll still believe in that anyhow. You know? well, yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, it's a this is a film about Richard, but I'm wondering if it's also a film about America and yeah. you know where we are at with truth right now. Yeah, I mean def definitely truth and guns and violence and all of that. And we tried not to say it. We were hoping it's just kind of obvious. I think we used to say it more hard, hard and heavy. And then as the film with, with the great editor, Aaron Wicken, and we kept finding the film, we started pairing back stuff that we thought the audience, let's just respect them. They'll, they'll get it on their own. But Richard holding that sign that says truth, that to me is a huge part of what the film is about, you know? Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Aaron. Um, and how you work together and also Jacob and Johnny and Daniel, if you were involved in the edit, because it, I did read that it, it, the structure took a while to figure out. And I wanted to know how you all played a part in solving that. Yeah. I mean, the, the producers were watching cuts uh, probably more than they wanted to, because I like showing and getting, getting thoughts and reactions. And I thought they were all, all three of them very helpful in the feedback um, and helping to find the film. Aaron Wickenden is just a great editor and a great person and a very sharp and creative mind. You know, when I would wake up going like, God, how, how are we going to put this together? He would wake up and call me like, I woke up this morning with a dream. I have five ideas to share with you. And I'm like, oh my God, uh, how, how do I get this guy involved in other aspects of my life? You know, like, what am I going to have for dinner? Uh, he seems to are, are always have an answer. And uh, so he was just very, very sharp and and. In terms of editors I've worked with, he was the fastest who would also deliver complete scenes, like polished, perfect, and quick. I don't know how he did that. Um, so I think working with them and also um, Joshua Oppenheimer, um, who's a friend and a great document documentarian um, who made The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence. And, and next year, he's embarking on a tremendous adventure of making his first fiction film, um, which I've read several drafts of, and it's amazing. You know, he he got on a long three-hour Zoom call with me and with Aaron and really was very insightful. He, he was starting, which is very good for feedback. He was just telling us what he responded to, what, like a heat-seeking missile, what was going to him, what was drawing him into the film and what he thought it was about. Then he asked us to describe what we were thinking and feeling. And then he tried to tell us what he thought wasn't helping us get to what we wanted. And hearing that conversation really helped Aaron and I, you know, start to restructure the movie. And after that, it took about six weeks until the film basically found its form. We kept honing it after that. But the, the foundation was kind of there after that. Okay. Um, I, I would just add, sorry to interrupt you, I would just add that um, something that was always very clear to to Ramin was uh, Clifford um, and the, the, the when Clifford would appear in the story. So while a lot of the structuring was kind of work in progress throughout the the, the edit, um, Ramin, you always had that clarity of mind that that Clifford would, would come and the reveal would come uh, yeah. at the end. Uh, which yeah, the idea of Clifford, you know, thank God that Johnny and Daniel found him. And my hope was just, I hope this man is deep and a good speaker. And he was beyond what we could have imagined he would be in terms of a deep soul and also a great humor. You know, his Starsky and Hutch line for me was incredible. And, um, you know, I, I imagined if we if we could have a chance to and be fortunate enough to speak to him, my thought was he would be a late a late um, guest to the dinner party, and that's how we edited it from the beginning. But still, Aaron and I one time did try. Well, what if we bring him earlier and then bring him back? It just didn't work as well. There was also a lot more footage around him, but um, he was really interesting. There were so many people that, of course, were interesting and didn't make the cut because the film just seemed to flow better without it. But thank God we found him. Um, I wanted to also ask about the, the decision to narrate the film. It, it, I kept thinking, this reminds me of someone, this reminds me of your voice, and it's Werner Herzog. You know, it's, I, I felt like it was a little bit like that. 
narration, like, I always wonder like why people decide to do it and why they don't. Um, can you talk about the decision to do it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, of course I love Werner's Ver films, his, his fiction and nonfiction films. I, I know there's many directors who narrate and then there's many who will swear away from it. Uh, I don't think there's rules in filmmaking, neither in fiction or in nonfiction. I, I just don't think there's any rules. Um, you know, it, it, there were certain elements to the film that were so, it was so, it became so long-winded for characters in the movie to explain X, Y, and Z things around the Zylon and material and storylines that I wasn't that interested in. I didn't really want to spend, um, Addie, I didn't want you to sit there for five minutes listening to Richard's company's trajectory, but you needed to know that happened. But I didn't feel it was that interesting for you to sit there and learn, oh, two thirds of cops and money. And it just wasn't interesting enough to me. I was more interested in the people. So if it wasn't text, it was gonna be narration and narration seemed like a way of guiding you through some of those story elements. Um, we talked with Johnny and Daniel about should it be me or should it be someone else, an actor? I would have been very happy for it to be an actor. And we even talked about a friend of mine who I love working with, great actor. But then it started to seem strange that an actor's voice would narrate the film, but then my voice would be asking questions in the context of the movie. I think if my voice wasn't behind the camera talking to people sometimes, I would have understood more and probably been gone with an actor. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of the reason. Okay. Yeah. I don't even know. I, by the way, Werner has a very distinct accent. So I don't well, know if I sound that way. What, and I don't, you, you have a hard time knowing what you sound like as a person, but I know a couple of things. Um, when I was doing it at home, mm -hmm. which was done like this, you know, you would set books up and you would talk into the phone, the scratch track, um, the feedback, I got feedback on my performance. And it was, there were negative comments about the performance. So what I did do was I brought in Alex Camilleri, who had been my assistant editor and associate editor for a decade. And I had helped him produce his first fiction film in Malta called Lutsu, which he wrote and directed and it won a big prize in Sundance. And he came with me to the edit room to direct. Oh, okay. And an actor friend of mine gave me another couple of feedback and I used those two things. So that was very helpful. Um, yeah, I don't, you don't sound like Werner, but it was very methodical and, you know, it, right. his speed, it, it just reminded me of that. But um, I know I only have a few more minutes. I wanted to ask the producers about funding. You mentioned that before, you know, money is always the hardest thing to get when it comes to docs. Um, and these days, more and more docs are being commissioned by streamers. So I'm wondering, how did you approach the funding? With this film because you can't really get grants for a film like this can you I mean yeah. uh well no th this one it, it, and Rami mentioned we, we met in COVID at the beginning of COVID so this whole thing this also happened in the vacuum of, of COVID which didn't make things easier by, by any stretch but really um we were fortunate that um it's actually a mutual friend of of Jacob and, and Daniel and myself, uh, Charles Dorfman, a producer, quite a prolific producer. He also just released, you know, Lost Daughter on Netflix and, um, and uh, you know, he's been involved in, in, in many films. Um, he was drawn to this immediately. And, um, and so he was the one who actually stuck his hand up originally and said, I, I, I wanna back this. And um, we then partnered with uh, Endeavor, uh, which is now called Fifth Season. Um, and uh, they also co-financed uh, Lost Order with with uh, Dorfman, Charles Dorfman, and so it was, it was those two parties that really backed this, and and they uh, they saw the vision in it, and um, and it just so happened that Charles is a mutual friend of Jacob and I, so it was kind of a perfect fit. Yeah, and I, I would just add that there are obviously a lot of docs are being commissioned now more than ever. Um, and uh, there's certain documentaries that that should be, um, and that's a better route. This felt to us that it would be a film, uh, especially with Ramin directing, that we would want to take to festivals, that we, we would want to really promote that way. And we maybe have more independence, freedom 
uh, if we were able to uh, fund it sort of via the independent route instead of going straight to to buyers before we we shot it. Uh, and fortunately, that happened pretty quickly, and we were able to to start shooting uh, quickly and go that route with our release in Sundance and and so on. I guess we should say th uh, thanks for God. Thank God you guys got all that together and made it easy for me. And um, you know, the producers backed me the whole step of the way all the way through the edit and and um i was grateful to work with them and you know thank god it, it had a good premiere at sundance and and south by and other places and and showtime um fortunately bought, bought the film and there'll be an announcement soon about a theatrical component to the release um this year great okay that's great um well i only have one time for one last question and i have to ask about the footage that didn't make it into the film. And um, I read that Richard created a bullet, he created a, and a cure for erectile dysfunction. So, um, what, you know, how well, much- two separate things. <laughs> um, you know, and how did, you know, it must have been hard. I mean, all the, what do you do with that footage? You have to do something with it, right? Well, I, I feel there could be a, a couple of short, short little, you know, dot pieces two, three minutes that could go with the, I don't know, a DVD release or the online release. Um, yes, his, his bullet, that's a very vicious story. Um, it's kind of, because he's a, he's a man creating and risking his life to save people, but then creating a bullet that rips people apart from the inside. It was so brutal. Um, his erectile dysfunction one is yes, more frightening and comedic. And he also I mean, the movie, like, hopefully the movie, I mean, it's strange because we're talking about all these kind of heavy subjects, but I think the movie's also pretty funny. Um, I think so too. I mean, and then I think you said he has a cure for how to what it was it like racial matters or I don't know. There was oh, some that, other that's also very brutal. His thoughts on yeah, yeah, uh, his thoughts on how to how to rid Detroit of its drug problems were pretty, pretty vicious. Well, on that note, um, <laughs> before we leave, uh, um, I don't know who how this works um, in terms of the Zoom and who has access to our chat, but there's a lot happening right now in Iran, which is where I'm from, and it's all I'm doing every day is looking at the news and talking to people and Instagram and Twitter and all these places that you get videos, and um, I hope people are watching, and um, you, I don't have there's no no real way to support from here other than you know letting the the these unbelievably courageous young women and men and also all generations of women and men there who are risking their lives um, many have been killed and there's this un unbelievably haunting song that has become the anthem that I put into this chat I have no idea who can see it but um I, I just hope people will pay attention Thank you for that. Um, and thank you all for participating today. I really appreciate it. And the film's great. Congratulations. And uh, good luck with the launch and award season. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.